the dear attendees, participants from background of companies. We have even background of people from individuals. Uh, some are in, uh, retrenched, unfortunately. Some are unemployed. But some are companies also looking to seek um, some sort of information. So as you can see, we have a whole lineup of wonderful speakers here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers as well. And also for you who made a right choice to actually come on board today to this webinar. It's a wonderful pleasure to have you on board. Uh, we'll be starting shortly at 3 p.m. sharp. So there is quite a number of um, interesting topics that we're looking for because as you know, COVID-19 is something that the world does not want, but the world is facing at this moment. And with these individual speakers, uh, uh, they will actually be touching on the areas of exa exactly of the topic of the webinar, which is massive retrenchment, unemployment, individuals upskilling and reskilling training towards IR 4.0 digital transformation. Okay. The objectives are quite clear. Is the session to connect with individuals who are jobs are retrenched or unemployed and provide industry 4.0 upskilling and reskilling programs. And lastly, to secure job placement upon training completion. So these are the areas that we'll be talking to. We'll be starting shortly. So do tune in as well. Those who are just tuning in and coming in on board as well, as I can see, um, we also have the, our, our um, Slido. Slido there as well. Can you please uh, log in to Slido on the, on the left, as you can see on the screen? This Slido screen is uh, important so that you will be able to uh, ask any questions available and also you'll be able to not only ask questions, you can also take part in the poll that we have. So Slido is sli.do. I repeat, sli.do. The code joining in is MITA. I repeat, MITA. So you're able to actually uh, take a look at Slido and ask questions as well. So as you can see, the questions that um, people are posting, we will have a list of questions that people will be uh, posting as well. All right. So shortly, we'll be starting in about two minutes. Okay. Yes. So welcome, welcome, people that are coming in from all over. Uh, people, you are able to also type uh, on the Facebook Live as well the comments down there if you like to say something. But most questions you'll be taking it on Slido, and I can see some live posts uh, which are running, uh, which you can see on Slido, which is what is the company, what is the situation of your company is facing now during this pandemic. Are you considering employee retrenchment, employee salary cut? Uh, are you considering freezing of hiring or would you be continuing hiring? Because as you say, wherever there's up, there's downs. So there would be companies who are hiring, of course, because they, are, they might be doing better. There will be companies who are also um, not hiring. So we want to understand a little bit about yourself and so on so we could actually find out. So the Q&A portion is important for us to understand the Q&A, uh, what sort of questions you would like to raise. So, uh, all right. It's almost three o'clock now. We'll be starting as well. So welcome to all the people and all ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you know, but Malaysia, we will start a little bit later. One, two more minutes extra. Okay. 
All right, let me just start with the beginning as well. Thank you very much, attendees, for coming in. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking your time here today to hear from insights from experts, key industry players. I'm Anthony Ng, the CEO of the Malaysian Institute of Technology, MIT Academy, and the moderator for today. Today's webinar is titled Massive Retrenchment and Unemployment, Individuals Upskilling and Training towards IR 4.0 digital transformation. The objectives of this session is to connect with individuals who are jobs are retrenched and unemployed and provide industry 4.0 upskilling and reskilling programs. And lastly, secure job placement upon training completion. Now, it's my pleasure to have the five wonderful speakers joining us today. We have Yang Bahagia Dato Saha. He's the Chief Employment Insurance Office Peso. A little bit of a brief on Dato Saha. He started his career in diplomatic and administrative services way back in January 1983. And he served in various departments before moving to the Ministry of Human Resource in 1998. And his career, his last career as Deputy Secretary General, Policy Internal Affairs, as position he held since October 2009. Wow until he retired in March 2017. He's now being appointed as Chief Officer of Employment Insurance System in Social Security Organization, SOXO, starting April 2017. He's to assist in establishing EIS without SOXO, within SOXO, including the implementation of EIS, ensuring logistics, staffing, development of ICT and other institutional arrangement. Today, also joining us with, with us is Yang Bahagia Dato Palani. He's the chairman of the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, TVET, and Future Skills Committee, ASEAN Future Workforce Council. A little brief about Dato Palani. Dato Palani also currently holds the position of a managing director of Satake Technologies Malaysia. In addition to this, he is currently being appointed by the government of Malaysia as chairman, industry cluster of the cabinet committee on TVET empowerment and inter-ministerial level cabinet committee to reformulate and strategize the direction of TVET in Malaysia. Concurrently, he's also serving as a board member of Human Resource Development Fund, HRDF. The government owns fund under Ministry of Human Resource Malaysia. At regional level, he is currently serving as chairman of ASEAN uh, Skills Workforce Council, a body led by business and industry that advances ASEAN-wide action on future skills and TVET development. We also have Inchit Rahim, the Deputy Director General of Malaysia Productivity Corporation, MPC, in short. A brief information about Inchit Rahim. He is currently the Deputy Director General Malaysian Productivity MPC. His current portfolio covers engagement with enterprises in promoting application of various productivity improvement tools for higher productivity growth. He is appointed to represent Malaysia as Vice President Awards for Asia Pacific Quality Organization APQO, overseeing the recognition of internal organizations and individuals in Asia Pacific from 2018 to 2019. He holds a Bachelor in Social Science and Economics, University of Science Malaysia, and Master's in Science and Human Resource Administration, University of Scranton in the USA. Next speaker we have today is Inche Nismar. He is the Chief Information Officer of Malaysia Automotive Robotics and IoT Institutes, MARI. Thank you. Inche Nismar represents the government and stakeholders of Malaysia automotive industry, on Industry 4.0 Business Digital Transformation Technology, Digital Engineering, Cybersecurity, and Smart Engineering Manufacturing. Let the IR I4.0 assessment and implementation of enterprise network and process integration to nine pillars of Industry 4.0. His background is software engineering, automotive and mobility technology, agile and knowledgeable management system deployment. Past experience of experience in IT and automotive industry, combining experience between industry 4.0 elements on big data analytics, 
agile knowledge management, lean production system, IT and engineering together with organizational and entrepreneurs that are kept abreast with the latest technological development. He's also involved in intelligent transport system ITS for mobility as a service mass development under automated drive telematics implementation simulation augmented reality integration. Wow, that is a lot about him. Now, the fifth and the last speaker today, which we have, is Dr. Sharo. He's the director of Durham Berhad in Innovation, Center of Innovation in Smart Manufacturing. A brief about Dr. Sharo, thank you. He's currently the director of Innovation in Smart Manufacturing at Standards Research Institute of Malaysia, CIRIM. His PhD was to study acoustic detection in signal processing for predictive maintenance. Over 18 years of experience in industry, his publication includes journals, technology articles. He's currently pursuing advanced research in predictive maintenance using artificial intelligence techniques as part of an implementation strategy with the Industry 4.0. Excellent. As the organizer and moderator of this webinar, MIT Academy 4.0, professional training provider. We have trained more than 3,000 engineers and technical graduates since 2012 and focus on training and upskill Malaysian towards IR 4.0 with collaboration with HRDF upcoming, Pekeso, Panraju, and many more. Attendees, if you have any questions, as I mentioned along the way, feel free to ask, post your questions in Slido. That's there. You may be able to post your questions there and you'll be able to ask. Hope that with one and a half hours, we're able to cover because there's so many things that we love to cover. So our first speaker itself that we have, the pleasure itself to have today and to share with you is Inche Abdul Rahim, the Deputy Director General of Malaysia Property Corporation to share his insights on the current situation and what are MPC views to help out the industries. So thank you very much. I hand it over to Inche Rahim to be our first speaker of today. Let's give him a thumbs up. Yeah, because we can't do a round of applause, we can do that. Okay, give him a thumbs up. All right. So over to you, uh, him. You can turn on your, 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 your microphone. Okay. As Incher Rahim is trying to go through his slides as well, uh, um, that is, uh, stay tuned to all the speakers itself because we have a lot of interesting and innovative ideas as well will be coming out that will be showing. And you guys can actually see what are the benefits that we are going to announce later at the end. A lot of other benefits that we announced. Inche Rahim, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Good afternoon, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, um, colleagues, and uh, participants of this uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to share um, the overview on um, the productivity performance as well as uh, impact from the COVID-19 uh, affecting uh, the, um, um, the Inshrahim, you can proceed. Okay, as, as, as per the um, uh, MCO that have been enforced in the country and also worldwide, um, from the study that have been undertaken by ILO uh, on the second edition, um, 2.7 billion workers uh, have been affected, um, where um, almost 81% of the world uh, workforce have been um, 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 affected uh, in which uh, they have not been able to productively um, contribute to the economy. 
So this is uh, something that uh, we believe have been affecting not only um, other countries, but uh, Malaysia as well. And as you can see from this study too, um, the, the, the highly affected uh, sectors, economy sectors are uh, in the accommodation and food services, uh, businesses and administrative activities, the manufacturing, uh, the retail trade, and as you can see also from the study by ILO, um, some other um, uh, considered uh, in the medium uh, category as well as in, in the medium uh, um, range uh, um, affecting uh, um, from this COVID-19 is construction, financial uh, activities, mining, uh, um, transport, uh, transport, storage and communication. So this gives uh, some back, uh, some some view about um, also um, what is happening in our country. And as you can see, from the key sectors which were affected by uh, by this uh, lockdown, um, basically it's in the um, services sector as well as uh, in the manufacturing sector. And uh, from these sectors, uh, almost 38 percent of the global workforce were affected at this place. Um, our concern is whether displacement is going to be temporary or is going to be a permanent displacement. So this is something that uh, maybe we can consider later on uh, deliberating to see uh, how we can address this issue. And as you can see too that uh, the these sectors uh, uh, in terms of the characteristic of uh, the workforce in this sector, um, it is labor intensive okay, in the millions, um, low wage, and obviously, when low wage, it is very much associated to, to the low skill. So this this is the scenario um, that have been painted by um, by by the ILO uh, internationally. Uh, back in our country, as you can see, um, um, from our workforce, um, um, uh, Malaysian workforce, we can see that we can see that um, only 27 percent of our workforce can be categorized as uh, skilled workforce and the remaining 73 percent is either in the semi skill or in the low skill and in terms of composition uh, from the 15 million uh, workforce in the country we've got uh, 15 percent uh, foreign workers and 85 percent Malaysian and look looking into these two uh, pie graph pie chart we can see that uh, um, almost 11 million of Malaysian uh, falls into the category of either they are either semi skill or they are either low skill. So this is uh, something that we, we we need to address, um, not just for COVID-19, but uh, post COVID-19. And this is very much reflected from our labor productivity. Um, the labor productivity stood at 91,972 for every employee employed and uh, from from this average national average we can see that manufacturing uh, recorded the, the 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 highest uh, above average uh, uh, re recorded recording 121000k in terms of labor productivity and for services it is at 86k and for uh, construction it, it is at 43k and uh, my analogy for um, for this uh, productivity performance, you can see on the left, uh, to 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 do um, uh, a job or task, uh, it takes a person in Singapore to to complete that task. And similarly, to complete that task in our country, it needs two person. So we are. Um, less uh, productive as compared to uh, the worker in in Singapore and from our productivity performance at 91,000 uh, our position have been at the 45th position uh, internationally and we have been at the position for I think more than 10 years so what it means is that um, despite the productivity growth uh, when we compare internationally other countries are growing their productivity much higher than um, Malaysia. So how do we how do we look into addressing the uh, productivity performance or productivity growth? Uh, as you can see here, um, I don't want to complicate this this uh, this um, subject. 
but what is important is that um, I want to focus on the capital intensity as well as the multi-factor productivity. Uh, when we refer to capital intensity, it is about putting in uh, um, um, machine technology in, in an organization. Um, meaning that we are measuring uh, how much do you um, input uh, in terms of technology or machine uh, per worker employed in, in an organization. However, when you look into multi-factor productivity, what is more important here is that despite of you having machine in an organization, how efficient have you been using the machine? And what are the innovative technologies that have been put in place? And you're also looking into the quality of workforce, whether your workforce are trainable, whether they are skillful, whether they are creative and innovative. And you're also looking into the quality of system. Um, so with this multi-factor productivity, which many countries have been focusing, especially in the developed economy, there's a need for us to look into um, trying to improve productivity using this, this strategy rather than uh, putting in more manpower into the economy. And this is also supported by uh, another study undertaken by uh, SME Corp and Huawei, uh, where you, we can see um, the application used by uh, entrepreneurs SME, um, application that contributed to higher productivity is very much less used by uh, our entrepreneurs. As you can see, for example, point of sales, just 19% of uh, respondents that respond to the survey indicated that they have used um, uh, points of sale. Or even CRM, which is even lesser, 12%. Supply chain, order, order fulfillment. So these are issues that uh, we all collectively have to address. Yeah? So it is not just having smartphone or internet connection, but it's more important for you, for for the enterprises to look into uh, addressing um, the uh, increasing in productivity through the application of um, um, digital technology. Uh, relating to that too, um, also a supporting figure uh, for the readiness assessment, uh, in which uh, METI have been undertaking this readiness assessment. And uh, as you can see here, from 121 applicants that have been approved for readiness assessment, uh, we have categorized them into actually five categories. I'm sharing with you three categories here. The lowest being the conventional um, and followed by a newcomer, learner, experience, and eventually the leader. So as, as you can see here, from 100 and 21 applicants that have been approved to undertake readiness assessment, uh, our applicants are still in the category of newcomer, 86% from 121 applicants, which means they have interest to pursue Industry 4.0, but with none or very minimal efforts undertaken. Yeah. So this is uh, something that um, we, we, we need to address, we, we need to collectively collectively address and to see how can we move further because uh, in this uh, time of crisis I think it will be a good opportunity for us to come out stronger come out better um, uh, as, as, as an enterprise and as an economy so uh, Anthony uh, that's end my presentation unless there is a question that um, any of the participant or you wanted to address yeah, thank you very much again, uh, Inche Abdul Rahim. Uh, a pleasure for your wonderful um, uh, presentation. There will be um, some questions that we would like to uh, ask you as well, where we actually gather some feedback as well from industries and so on. Um, uh, some questions like, okay, how is MPC addressing the productivity challenge in the country, including Nexus? Readiness assessments for IR 4.0. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, basically, when we look into this uh, productivity uh, um, equation, that the two sides of the uh, equation. First is the uh, uh, private sector, and the other one is the public sector. So, for the private sector, we we have established a nine nexus um, in Sorry, which this nexus have been Rahim. 
would you be able to unshare your slides? All right. Okay. Okay. Yes. We, we we have established uh, what we call nine nexus, and this nexus have been led by the captains of industry, and the nexus actually nexus that have been uh, we identify that have potential to improve in terms of productivity. So engagement have been undertaken in in the nexus with the players, with the enterprises, and to find ways on how to improve productivity. The second uh, equation, part of the equation, is the public sector. Uh, the public sector, we have been working closely with uh, ministries, with agencies, with regulators, uh, looking into uh, addressing the good regulatory practice. So we are trying to get the ministries, the regulators to see what um, the burdens for uh, industry to do business and find ways on how to reduce this burden through um, reviewing regulation, uh, make it more simple to do business, uh, um, unnecessary forms, information requested, which is not necessary, then um, we we should do we should do away with, with with it. So we are working closely with these ministries, with the regulators to address um, to address those those issues. And um, on top of that, like I mentioned earlier on, on the readiness assessment, I think uh, the ministry has been given allocation uh, to undertake. Um, um, the readiness assessment and my two colleagues here as the panelists have been involved also in the assessment and and we believe that uh, with the, the solution provided we will be able to to lift proc our enterprises uh, to um, to to greater heights in terms of increasing in productivity however as i mentioned mentioned earlier on collectively we 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 must together move into uh, being a better enterprise, a better organization, um, uh, not just waiting for this COVID-19 to take place, but uh, productivity should always be on top of the agenda in, in driving our business. Thank you. Oh, there is uh, questions on Slido, which I'm um, opening up. Unfortunately, Inshir Rahim is, um, I think he had something to do. So let's just move on to the questions on, on Slido. Yep, okay. So some questions, if some of you can actually take a look. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see on my screen here, that we have a few questions with all these six questions are all related to a lot related to Soxo and Pekeso. So I think Dato Saha, we might need your attention to some of these questions. I will take uh, the first, I, first question is, during this period of time, can we have employees to use part of their paid annual leave? Uh, if they take the wage subsidy program, can they retrench workers who earn more than 4K during April to October 2020. Um, yeah, these are the, the first two questions. I think I will address it. Uh, will we be able to get Dato Saha? <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Anthony. Um, the question being asked is di very difficult for, for me to, to answer, you know, because uh, based on the advice from the ministry, no employer uh, should uh, retrench workers or, uh, or reduce the salary of the workers during during the um, during the well well, well they are still receiving um, wage subsidy and the employment retention program. Uh, please refer this question to labor department. We just advise for employer not to um, not to retrench workers and also reduce the salary. Okay, you thank you very much. Uh, um, Saha. Okay, so we uh, we have uh, Inche Abdul Rahim. Your second question that we are here to ask as well. 
what are your lessons that SME can learn from this? Uh, sorry, what what do you keep? How do you keep your engagement channels during MCO for MPC? <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I, uh, we, we we have been keeping our engagement with not only with our employee, our staff, but also with our customers, with our partners, associates, and, and network. And uh, we have been using this uh, digital technology platform. Various uh, digital technology platform have been have been utilized, have been used. Uh, for example, with our partners, associates and customers, I think we have been organizing uh, more than 96 uh, sessions since uh, the MCO. Uh, we were total of uh, 20, more than 25,000 participants taking part in, 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 in our program. And, and for the staff, uh, uh, the communication channel was um, to conduct uh, online training, to, to, what they call, to organize uh, online meetings, so which which is taking place so it's it's like um, it's like working but you're not putting on your your corporate shirt uh, you, you're more casual uh, but you you are keeping in touch with with each other during during this period so we we, we are connected and we are connected not only with our employees uh, with also with our um, with our uh, customers yeah in, in fact, the committee for the uh, facilitating business uh, have been meeting. Pemuda have been meeting uh, regularly to 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 share some of the issues uh, raised by the the industries. So um, yes, it's it's a productive MCO. I I must say. All right, that's wonderful to hear. Okay, next question is: uh, What are your views on reducing foreign workers? Because maybe they say the next. First foreign worker that can take a flight could be maybe only six months from now or one year from now. And also, what are your views on that? And to train locals on using robotics, automation, IR 4.0, anything to increase productivity. Thank you, Anthony. 76% 70, of our SMEs are micro. So there's a big chunk and uh, we, we thought uh, what is important is uh, taking into consideration this uh, COVID-19. Um, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they, they need to review their business model. Um, they, they need to relook into their um, uh, what do you call digital technology uh, application. Uh, in fact, um, they, they must go back to basic that is on the financial management. Because when we have this web, webinar session, um, uh, we, we discover that Companies must have uh, some kind of cash reserve to ensure that they're able to sustain uh, crisis uh, similar to COVID. So these are lessons that 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 uh, what we call that the SMEs must learn. I mean, going back to basic financial management, digital technology, and and to find ways to uh, what we call to 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 use uh, the best of our existing resources. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Inche Rahim. So. Uh, as you can see, all these questions and so on. We'll take on um, uh, other questions as well later on. If um, there is questions to Inshir Rahim, you can actually type directly the questions of which speaker you would like them to answer. So Inshir Rahim, stay on the line. Uh, thank you very much. And let's move on to our second speaker. Next, we have Yang Bahagia, Datuk Palanil Joseph. He's the chairman of Federation of Malaysian Manufacturer TVET and Future Skills ASEAN. Future Workforce Council to share his thoughts on the current situation and what FMM is provi uh, providing during this situation. Let's hear it from Dato Palani. Dato? Dato Palani? All right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and also the member of panel. I think it's uh, some very familiar friends uh, that we have, we have bumped to each other in various forums previously. So I think, and, and also thank you for extending the invitation for FMM to, to, to share our thoughts in this uh, webinar. Right. First of all, I think as you know, uh, as, as the overall, everyone is talking about the industry. And, and I think uh, we are I'm coming from the area that is hardest hit. And, and, uh, and I think uh, we are working on various uh, uh, initiatives and efforts to ensure that our member companies are be able to back to, to run 
to the normal uh, situation, which is, is, is a uh, huge task. But FMM itself actually has been continuing with our service to the members. We have been working very closely with uh, METI, MIDA, and also various other uh, ministries to ensure that the the challenges and the uh, that is faced by the uh, the uh, manufacturers, which I think uh, a majority of our members are from the SME category, are uh, well addressed and then the issues are being brought forward for due consideration. All right, but I think as you know, uh, we did a survey to see the real impact of how that is looking at, and that is was done. Uh, I mean, I have to say that this done uh, between April six to ten. That's very much at the early phase of the uh, COVID pandemic. And I probably, I think the data may and would have definitely varied from the time of the survey, but that's the latest that we have. We did uh, with a respondent about 419 respondents, mostly is from 90% from the manufacturing and manufacturing related services. And I think I would just say that uh, the data shows about 56.6% of the, uh, the respondents they indicated that they have got the revenue dropped more than 50%, and we have got another 24.6% indicated that their revenue dropped between 30 to 50%. So uh, the impact is uh, real, and, and I think uh, the the uh, the industry is crunching the data and impact as it goes to see what would be the right ways to to move forward. But I think and and, and there are various. Uh, ways and means because you see the sustainability in business is being able to survive and overcome these uh, challenges. I think uh, uh, the the impact of it is well known and well spoken and many I think uh, worrying uh, horrifying statistics has been actually put forward but I believe I think as the business move we'll find the right way to to go through overcome these challenges and and because at the end of the day it's about survival. But in that context, in that context, I think there are various ways and means being employed, applied to ensure that because I has to relate to our topic of discussion today on unemployment and the challenges. I think uh, it is always uh, uh, retrenching people is, is the last option on the table and any employers would try their level best to explore various uh, options that's, that's available before resorting to uh, retrenchment, which is inevitable when your business is no more able to give you the right revenue. But I think from the from the data that we have as of now, we could see that about 67 companies indicated they would be probably freezing the uh, aid count in the next three to six months and probably longer. And then also uh, about 59% indicating they are, they are considering uh, various ways and means like unpaid leave, uh, non-contractual allowance, freezing, and various ways. But the bottom line is to get things to run uh, when uh, when the the, uh, the lockdown period ends and, and you've got to get things moving. All right. But I think uh, having said that, uh, it may not be a scenario of uh, loose and loose in a situation. So I think uh, moving forward, moving forward, I think this situation has actually brought uh, a fantastic challenges but I, and also at the same time opportunity and I would like to 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 start off because I don't want to come over as an employer and and keep on saying that we all have uh, not moving forward. But I think uh, I would say that this situation has created a fantastic uh, opportunity for changes. And, and, and I think I would like to share with you uh, today some of the points that I've, I, I believe that can be looked up and looked on uh, on how that we are going to innovate and change uh, vis a vis to the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think one of the uh, the real uh, uh, situations going to come back is uh, the uh, highly, highly automated uh, production manufacturing infrastructure. I think that is going to be one of the way forward because we, we have, would have realized uh, the, the, uh, the, the effect of, I mean, it can also contribute in reducing the cost, the quality of environment, and also the enhance of the continuity. I think that is one of the biggest learning points I would like Chirai mentioned. I think as we are embarking on IR 4.0 readiness, probably the, this pandemic has given an extraordinary push and realization to various industry to really uh, consider the technology driven method as a way uh, forward. That's one. And number two, I think uh, we are also facing an enormous change in consumer behavior. All right. I think this is a, a completely a new way of 
uh, of, of uh, operating where there's a high confidence in technology. You like it or you don't like it, you go to use technology to lead. And then, and then, you know, so for those people who have really been very conservative, I think there's a high sense of reliability only online transactions, uh, uh, e-based uh, platform. And I think this is going to transform the entire landscape of uh, business as well as the employment uh, in the world, vis-a-vis -vis also in our country, right? We, we, I think the, there's going to be a big departure of a brick and mortar set up huge office and, and I think there's going to be a lot of consideration whether you could run business the same way you did it or probably you could do find better productive and more cost effective way of running things right and I think like this kind of webinar sessions going on eh, probably that will actually tremendously reduce reduce business related travels and <laughs> So I think so, I, and and, I, and and concurrently, there's going to enhance the usage of video conferencing, technology-based uh, communication, and and way, and that is also going to create a, a new complete platform of opportunities for professionals who are involved in that area, which I'll touch on the second part of this thing. And I think uh, on the fourth point, uh, I think uh, we have also seen probably in certain countries, if you read through, I think that. There's extensive usage of e-service in the government handling. I think United Arab Emirates, uh, one of the foremost case study recently showed that they have got a fantastic uh, e-system which actually operated as during the pandemic, so nothing happened. And that probably some benchmark where the government operations may change. And when the government operation changed towards technology and probably all the private sectors that is actually concurrently will be moving in that direction. And that's another opportunity, I believe, in the pilot. Probably, I think the way Murray came out with the solution for the uh, industries to apply for the exemption, the open fact, uh, the application was open. Probably, it's a good case study where uh, we start to automate even the application process, which is related to government procedures. All right. So, uh, and other than that, I think uh, there is going to be emergence of, I believe, a tremendous amount of technology, new technology setups. And I think that it is going to be driven by creativity and innovation. And I'm, I'm seeing that despite this big issue of unemployment among the fresh graduates, but probably there's going to be this, 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 this group of people who is going to explore into this new uh, uh, tech driven opportunity. All right. So, and, and I think uh, other than that, probably we know there's a very good positive impact on the environment. As you know, uh, I think the, the International Climate Center, there's a research center based in Oslo, estimate that it's about 1.2% decline in carbon dioxide emission uh, using global GDP forecast from OECD. So the environment is getting better. Probably valuation, I think those areas of job where it related to environment probably is going to get more uh, happening uh, in that sense because there's a lot of focus in that area. So I've, I've just, just uh, raised to you some of the potential changes, but coming back to the topic, I think one of the biggest area that we're going to change is could be the education. The concept of the way to, to, to teach and also to learn is, is going through a major uh, transformation. As I think all of you will remember, I mean, to recall, the, le the latest uh, World Economic uh, WF statistic that I think uh, that we, we know indicated that it's done by Dell Technology Services uh, indicated that probably, probably uh, there would be about 65%. Eh? I think uh, uh, they indicated 85%, sorry, 85% of the jobs in 2020 that is targeting the generation set and health uh, is yet to be invented. All right. And I think another interesting study is also according to the World Economic Forum report, 65% of primary school children today will be working in job types that does not exist yet. Right. So I think this is a this is a fantastic uh, scenario where the concept the concept of of uh, learning and also unlearning and relearning is going to be a major changing point uh, in terms of the the new. Uh, challenges because I think uh, if you analyze it, we are, we are looking at. Uh, I would like to draw. I think all of us are talking about uh, work. Uh, the generation we are now having. We are now at a generation Z, and this generation Z. I think. I think the the oldest probably they are now at 25 years old, which means that will be the the biggest yeah. group. 
And I think if you look at this generation Z, they are completely a different generation than what was the previous one. And I think one of the, I mean, if you look at one of the study, I think 60% of them, 60% of Gen Z says they, that they like to collaborate and share their knowledge with others online. And another 93% of the students who are in this category says that they feel confident as they understand the technology well. And the third one, 50% of Gen Z say they cannot live without YouTube. Wow. All right. So, okay. I think, I mean, uh, the what I'm putting forward here is that a context where if we are looking into uh, the uh, the unemployment that has probably has, that has taken place and that is going to take place in the near future, and but business is not going to roll, uh, they, they are not going to close down just for the sake because you are unable to continue. Uh, business is going to reinvent itself, finds what is the best way to operate and overcome areas where they were less productive and uh, where they need to be more innovative and also enhance the technology usage. When this happens, it is very important for employees actually to embark on this process of unlearn and relearn. And, and, and it is also about reskilling. I think that is probably one of the biggest challenge that, uh, that I think, uh, I mean, I, yes. I believe there's a lot of audience here who could be in various categories that may, they could be in organization that probably sinking or probably that has given indication that they are in a tough time. But what is the way forward is that to look at how can you add value when your organization re-strategize and revisit their own ways of doing business. And that, that would be a big asset for that organization if the employees started to look at various ways means tools and also mechanism to move forward. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm throwing this proposition and I'm, I think uh, very much uh, synchronized because as you see, when we are talking about IR 4.0, it is going about some, it's not going to be about people losing job. It is going to be about new job being created and whether existing people have got themselves ready and whether they are ready to transform themselves to unlearn and relearn. Right. That's one of the challenge uh, moving forward. And I think from FMM side, we have been uh, embarking on a very uh, rigorous uh, initiative towards uh, IR 4.0. And I think uh, we work very closely with uh, MITI, uh, in fact, on the IR 4.0 uh, initiative. And then uh, our, our concentration towards our members is that to advocate our members to explore uh, the change point that's available via the various platform on the IR 4.0. But it is not something that we can plug from air and then start and suddenly say you are now IR 4.0. It is a work in progress. It's a continuous change of not only a change of technology, but as a change of mind, right? So it's, it's, uh, it is where I, I believe uh, that what that we need to look forward as we embrace uh, the challenges that brought forward by COVID-19. Uh, so that's that's in a brief nutshell of what I'm looking at as my my thoughts on how do we look forward from from the employment perspective. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dato Palani. There's a couple of questions as well which are coming up. Um, I see on Slido as well. Some questions which are more related that I think you you'll be able to answer. <clears throat> the other questions, uh, leave it up to maybe um, Dato Saha. Um, questions like. What are specific areas of upskilling and reskilling that are required in the three major um, industries? That's one question. All right. Three major industry referring to. Um, what are they? Uh, the, 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 that's the question. Yeah. Okay. Which right. other? Maybe maybe I could say that. Maybe what are the industries which are high, which are required uh, upskilling and training? Maybe that's specifically what industries are you looking for that. OK, I think uh, I mean, in, in, in a very definitive, I think manufacturing is one of the uh, fundamental area where we are looking into. Uh, I think there would be a lot of opportunity uh, for the upskilling and uh, uh, reskilling scenario because as business reinvent itself, as business model changes and also the 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 uh, the fact the the uh, the indicator of productivity may vary. 
then I think these are, could be the areas where in some areas where the employee's fundamental skill could be a fixed set of area. But probably now with the automation, you may need some technicians who are very familiar with machines to learn about, learn about data uh, analysis and data interpretation in fundamental because probably you may not really need people to do fixing that much, but and you may need people to be able to interpret the data that comes up. So that's going to be something a little bit out, but it still requires the fundamental knowledge of, of interpreting the figure, but then your baseline in getting it is not waiting for the machine or your equipment to run, uh, you know, to run uh, is no more functioning than only you come in. Probably you will intervene much more earlier. So such kind of areas uh, could be something new. And I think also uh, the uh, digital based platform is going to be something enormous. Many companies who are now, I think, uh, during this period, uh, has actually got themselves registered with Alibaba. They have got themselves registered with various sales platform. And then you're no more relying on a, a kind of a human based marketing system, but you are working on a smart learning platform. So the knowledge of getting into that kind of thing, uh, that kind of platform could be some, a new skill that that is required probably. Yeah. Also, um, other questions as well to look into is like, according to the FMM survey report, right? There's about 70% 70 companies took the wage subsidy. Why the other 22% are not actually taking the wage subsidy? Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Okay, all right. So I think, uh, as you know, the, uh, uh, we have got, uh, there are some companies about, I think 50 companies indicated they're not able to claim, uh, partly because uh, the uh, the average of the workers earning is uh, that is uh, above 400, which is not covered under the scheme. Then uh, we also, uh, uh, they also about 22.4%, they didn't apply because they are large companies uh, whereby they are not able to meet the 50% reduction in revenue condition, mm -hmm. right? Other than that, uh, uh, there are also some uh, indication, for example, like uh, that despite the coverage that is given, probably that the impact would be much more bigger that you may not be able to sustain the employment despite getting the thing. So they also wouldn't want to get into a difficult situation if they need to uh, make some decision as move forward. So it's a mixed kind of a, a scenario. Uh, some companies uh, were in a dire strait, explore it, but some companies wanted to see uh, where, how to, to go about it in that context. I see. All right. Um, there's other questions that I would like to share a little bit. Um, as you can see on Slido, okay, uh, I will take the most popular questions out there because there's too many questions. So if you would like your questions to be heard itself, because there's tons of questions coming in and we don't have much time, but maybe at, at, at the end, we're able to address uh, some of this. The popular questions are coming out like, uh, I think this is to Dato Saha. If it's Dato Saha, you're available to answer. A few Pekeso officers have stated that employers Participating in a wage subsidy program can retrench employees who earn above four thousand. Is that true? Dato Saha. Yeah, I, I leave it that to the employer. But <clears throat> as a government, we encourage uh, the employer, if possible, not to retrench this worker workers as, as well. Eh? Okay, good. To Sokso again. Retrench pay cut example for E and E who are not under the wage subsidy program, regardless of whether the employees earn 4K or less or not, will X qualify from WSP? Yeah, <clears throat> for 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 those uh, workers who earn more than uh, uh, 4,000 and above, they are, they are not entitled for to get the benefit from from ERP and the wage subsidy. I see, I see. Okay. All right. So later on, we'll try to get some more questions from here itself. Um, as um, Dato Palani, uh, his session. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dato Palani, for your session. We have one last question uh, for you itself, which is, what do you think um, in terms of your view on IL 4.0 in terms of pre, during, and post-COVID? The com combination of all these three. <laughs> you, you, are com you are combining something that's very difficult to combine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's uh, I think uh, it's it's something like a combining. Uh, uh, we are comparing a new uh, old world and a new world, all right. And I think many would agree that 
the ecosystem would will entirely change. But what is actually would be something that is uh, will be there permanently is that I believe the the impact, the velocity of the implementation of IR 4.0 and technology driven initiatives is going to get much more bigger by leap and bound. I think a lot of people who have been thinking that uh, we are still at 2.0, there's a long way to go, we will take time and it will it will, it will will not move, I think uh, will, would have changed the mind and would have now realized that one of the best ways to survive under this environment uh, post uh, uh, pandemic or in, in any event, I think in future we wouldn't, we, 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 there could be a lot of this kind of risk and, and from a business risk continuity point of view, it is very, very pertinent for us to invest and also to be involved in the IR 4.0 as we prepare. You, you could be in any element of business, be it service, be it manufacturing, but I think the way that technology is going to enter our workspace and our business environment is beyond, uh, undoubtedly is beyond uh, any doubt. But I think what is important is that as we move on to this, it is very, very critical for employees as far as I think they are facing these uh, challenges of, uh, of uh, employment, but it is very important to take opportunity of various initiatives that's available, which I think is either through the employer's platform or through various government initiative platform to change. All right. And then, and uh, I would actually uh, add on by saying that for the employers, it is actually one of the last thing to do is to, to uh, explore retrenchment. All right, that's the last thing to do because it will be a loss of uh, skills that has been nurtured and trained over a long period. And it is very important for both sides now to explore and see how we could retain the skill, but at the same time, the agility and the willingness of the employees to change and embrace this change is going to be very, very critical because you need the right people to support the organization to move forward. All right, so right. that's the way forward. Thank you very much, Dato Palani. Um, so. Yeah. He had a wonderful speech, so we can actually give him a thumbs up in our Facebook. Give him a thumbs up. Yeah. So let's move on to the next speaker itself. We have Inche Nisma, the CIO of Mari, to share with us about the current situation and the new digital skills for economy era, e-learning and business in the age of experience as well. So thank you very much, uh, Inche Nisma. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hi, Jenny. Yes. yes, thank you, Anthony. Yes, yes. Okay, so today I will be talking about the that related to the uh, new skill for a digital economy era. This one uh, pretty much related to the uh, impact of how people are moving towards e-learning uh, and also uh, uh, the businesses also have been transformed in the age of experience uh, covered under the COVID-19 impact. I will not cover uh, much on the impact uh, because it's already been discussed and also uh, highlighted by a few other uh, participants. Uh, and then I will move uh, on the recovery plan uh, by leveraging on the digital economy uh, uh, platform. Okay. You may you, yeah, you can continue. Okay. Uh, on the digital economy, uh, most of us are aware that the, the digital economy is already uh, permitting uh, multiple aspects of the world economy and impacting sectors, of course, uh, businesses and also workers. Uh, in uh, under the COVID-19, with the next uh, billion people coming online, it will become an even more important uh, for the driver uh, under innovation and also competitiveness and growth. Uh, digital technology are changing the way we do businesses and redefining global value chains. Uh, for example, like platforms such as Grab, Airbnb, Uber, and Foodpanda uh, disrupting traditional business model. Uh, and also, uh, I will also highlight it about the new skills of how people are moving and explore on the algorithm, the artificial intelligence, uh, and also blockchain are uh, disrupting a, a professional services, uh, while the Internet of Things and also uh, 3D printing are changing the industries such as uh, manufacturing and also healthcare. 
but uh, of course uh, when we highlight about this other uh, are we uh, quantum leap into this implementation without having a strong uh, policies uh, to answer that actually uh, other government who have a very strong policy that already uh, covers uh, on the implementation toward uh, the digital economy and also to upskill uh, our uh, workers into this implementation by having, if you can see under the uh, box uh, dotted red one, uh, we have the national IT roadmap, the industry forward, uh, the national uh, industry 4.0 policy. All these are the one that related under MITI and also that related uh, under our uh, agencies. Uh, okay, uh, on the e-commerce roadmap, uh, and also the strong one that uh, re really related uh, with MARI under the NAP 2020. So by having this uh, supportive government policies, uh, whereby it already have its own roadmap and also blueprint, uh, to trickle it down into the implementation, we need to have a strong justification and also strong uh, fundamental of a digital platform. So if you can see, when we highlight about the strategic deployment, uh, we can see because of MARI, we are very keen and also strong on the implementation of the automotive and overall mobility. And currently, we are shifting into the industry 4.0 related. That's why you can see at the uh, fundamental of it, uh, under the, the one that we highlighted under the MITS, this is the intelligent technology system, whereby even the people are talking about the e-learning, the platform for upskilling, people using the uh, digitalization within the factory. To translate it with uh, from the policy expect, you, in, you need to have these uh, four areas of uh, fundamental of the infrastructure that we need to provide, the platform as a service and also a software as a service. Uh, for the SMEs and also for the enterprise uh, companies, uh, most of them, they can do this uh, based on the hybrid solution, meaning to have uh, by having uh, based on your own uh, fundamental of uh, this technology of infrastructure or to have it a hybrid in the cloud uh, for us to share uh, to deploy on this uh, implementation so other than that you can see on the top of it uh, we can see the the use cases uh, that's why each of the UK use cases were highlighted because most of us uh, currently are as a knowledge workers uh, we also highlight about people uh, retrieving the data, the information, the knowledge and wisdom. This is very important because of uh, currently if you are shifting uh, from the skilled workforce uh, into the knowledge workers, uh, they are now moving towards of uh, identifying this and uh, for us to have the implementation and also to store all this uh, data and also knowledge uh, within a certain, certain strategic deployment. So uh, I relate it back into the policy of government. We have lots of policy, but uh, to justify it, uh, uh, even under MARI, we are highlighting that this way forward is uh, on the real implementation by having a real platform uh, for us uh, to move forward and to have a quantum leap within this uh, upscaling of uh, human capital development. So other than that, because of uh, we try to show the best practices that related to us, uh, we have, uh, for example, under the automotive and also overall mobility, you can see that uh, currently we are shifting from the uh, uh, under the human capital development from the uh, what we call under the uh, era of phase one up to the phase two. You can see under the previous one, manufacturing, assembly and services, most of us already have uh, shifted and also uh, go into the implementation of from industry 2.0 up to 3.0. But on the phase two of the technology development, you can see that uh, there's a things that related to uh, data or having a retrieving of the information that we need to analyze. But having to do uh, into the more uh, advanced step, uh, because this is we need to separate uh, into two. For example, like uh, currently we have uh, focusing on the manufacturing or on the product design or the product technology itself. So because most of us are talking about the development into the technology that related to the manufacturing, 
but other than that we need also to focus on the other uh, technology that focus into product in these cases is is uh, under automotive or on the overall mobility so the three focus groups areas are regarding human capital development programs and of course uh, i will show uh, on how uh, we can see the red one the areas to be developed to enhancing r and d and design capability but of course that under this uh, current uh, situation people maybe can be more focusing on the areas that they want to implement for example uh, the thing that we try to highlight here is on the talent heat map, heat map for autonomous and automated uh, connected vehicle and of course uh, for autonomous vehicle or autonomous robotics now is pretty much uh, more relevant into the era of uh, where we we try to uh, identify and to use uh, the autonomous vehicle to assist uh, under the implementation of uh, uh, for autonomous vehicle and also uh, for the purpose of uh, having uh, um, uh, shifting into the IR 4.0 implementation by using the autonomous uh, 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 platform. Okay, so you can see here that the 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 red one, the red one is the talent shortage in Malaysia. So it's not only can be used under the critical areas in Malaysia uh, for AACV, but of course it uh, can be deployed uh, under uh, various of uh, nine pillars of industry 4.0. Uh, in the industry 4.0 uh, technology on the nine pillars, we separate it into two uh, uh, areas or clusters. Uh, for example, like uh, the four pillars of the advanced ICT is focusing on the cloud computing, the IoT and also the big data analytics and few others. Uh, on the advanced manufacturing, this is somehow uh, the way that we focusing on the uh, the another four areas of technology whereby for people are focusing on the additive manufacturing, augmented reality and also others. Uh, but on the pillars of the uh, technology of uh, the, the one that we call as a system integrator, that one is the most important thing, whereby on the talent uh, and also upscaling, we are focusing on the uh, implementation of uh, the system integrator, whereby they need both uh, areas on the advanced ICT and also advanced manufacturing. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is not only focusing for uh, manufacturing, but the thing that we want to uh, achieve uh, on the product uh, development, uh, on for example, like our best practices on automotive or other the one that we want to benchmark with. Okay, okay. Uh, on going uh, to the area of uh, how we want to have a successful return uh, under the in uh, the by using or leveraging under the industry 4.0, uh, going back into the uh, six building block that we highlighted here is on the restarting uh, supply chain, uh, the separation of region, uh, testing and transparency, uh, infection reduction norms, health system capacity, and also think about uh, back on the rehiring and retraining. Uh, this uh, building block uh, should be rolled out and uh, sequenced according to company level. Uh, this one is not, uh, it should be customized based on the company uh, level and also uh, the sectors and also the clusters of it. So, uh, you can see the two that we highlighted uh, is on the restart, restarting of supply chain and also on rehiring and retraining. Okay, so uh, when we go into the action, this is... Uh, um, uh, the the diversification uh, and also the R and D activities that uh, currently we think uh, is very important. This is for short short term, six month uh, to one year, uh, three to six month. Uh, for example, like a collaboration to produce PPE for frontliners, vendors or company uh, to begin uh, to uh, to shift and also to uh, 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 leveraging on their equipment and also tools uh, to assist on this and also on the how the government to consider on special technology fund for uh, companies uh, that participate to perform r&d activities this one to combat uh, covid 19 
and also to assist on how uh, we will go into shifting on the restarting of supply chain because currently we need to have the new related SOP uh, for for us to go back uh, in and also to face uh, the new normal the new norm okay so uh, other than that uh, we can see on the identify the potential company based on the industry uh, readiness of course this one going back to the industry forward implementation but maybe in a full scale without uh, uh, waiting on the government implementation of industry forward but uh, really to shift into this uh, area uh, for to have uh, uh, the infrastructure ready and also to have the upskill ready and also to uh, move into the e-learning uh, platform Okay, on the um, highlighting back on the, uh, uh, the sick building block for successful return uh, on the restarting of supply chain, one of the areas uh, that we think uh, that can uh, really assist uh, uh, under the MARI Industry Forward uh, Technology Platform, whereby uh, we are focusing on the advanced production management information system uh, for us to do a coordination uh, daily operation in detail. Uh, if, you, if you're aware about uh, the, the level of how people uh, 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 do the faces into the, the implementation of the full uh, business intelligence monitoring of the uh, shop floor or manufacturing. So it will be have uh, a combination of uh, MITP at the level of BI and also uh, uh, connect it with the ERP system and also uh, up to the level, uh, level of uh, manufacturing education uh, system. But all these are under the open platform whereby it will, uh, under MARI, we uh, tweak it a little bit uh, to make it uh, customized for SMEs uh, and also uh, to avoid the complexity of having an enterprise solution uh, that uh, most of the SMEs of uh, company doesn't really need uh, to have uh, the whole component of it. Okay, so other than that, uh, this is just, uh, for example, example of how uh, we uh, see on the SOP. This is how uh, people need to have this uh, to make it also a digitalization because if, if we, we do this as a manual uh, SOP, it will be uh, very difficult for us to implement, uh, to implement it and also to monitor it in future. Okay, uh, other than that, I will go straight away into the uh, related to, this is still talking about the, uh, the digitalization. As you can see now, I combine it uh, to highlight about the, how people, the, the, the below one is how it translates from the whole policy that I highlighted before this on how it should be implemented because the policy uh, must be translated into the implementation uh, of having this infrastructure or uh, the, the platform itself. So you need to have this uh, uh, hybrid concept and that under your own company or you have it under the cloud services and then provide it, combine it with the MITP, the, the industry forward technology platform that I highlighted you can see there uh, how we engage and also link it back into the BI, ERP, MES, and also uh, seeing it uh, with the, uh, the shop floor of uh, having a PLC and also sensor actuators. Uh, so moving towards on the smart manufacturing from the previous ISA 95, uh, this is the skills that uh, people need to highlight more when it's related to the manufacturing now state. So I think uh, after this, uh, when we have a good restart, uh, moving towards of the restarting the supply chain, this can be one of the considerations that people can use uh, because it uh, can be really easy to be kickstart uh, when we do it as a uh, refresh one. Okay. So, okay, this one uh, a bit different. Uh, on the manufacturing or on the production side. This is how the mobility as a service, uh, one of the pillars also under uh, National Automotive Policy 2020, whereby the transformation of uh, towards the e-commerce platform, whereby we see the mobility aspect of uh, the way of uh, seeing things 
under these three areas of mobility you write. Uh, this one uh, where the mobility that they carry us and also mobility you carry. This is related to phone, uh, our, uh, the thing that we carry and also mobility that you control. And uh, in future, they, will, uh, they can work independently uh, with the implementation of AI and also autonomous uh, development. So these are the things, I think the skills that uh, people now uh, need to focus on also, uh, not uh, only when we go back in, into this uh, restarting the, the supply chain, uh, if we want to have a, a new skill set, this is one of the areas that uh, I think uh, most of the companies uh, can uh, leverage and also to think back on the implementation of uh, to uh, restart this uh, fresh. Okay, so you can see, for example, like this in here, uh, the scale up company. I think uh, most of them also affected, uh, but uh, the 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 thing that uh, the the providing uh, this kind of services can also be implemented uh, by other startup and also to focus on the uh, scale up uh, up to the level of how uh, people are now moving and using this the digital platform for the sharing concept uh, or for multimodal transportation, the e-payment, uh, of course, that is one of the important things right now. The telematics, not only to have the telematics within the car, but telematics, uh, meaning uh, to have the IoT devices, to uh, to have this as a visibility and also to have a connected living under this uh, implementation. Okay. Uh, Okay, now uh, moving towards uh, because I will not cover the whole the six building blocks. Uh, I will start on the restarting on supply chain and then uh, uh, leave it into the rehiring and retraining. So on the rehiring and retraining, uh, uh, you can see uh, under the benefit of smart e-learning, uh, we combine this uh, under the three uh, areas of the corporate, uh, whereby uh, combination of uh, with the public learning and also under learning of uh, LMS. Uh, this is to have uh, talent recruiting for the massive open uh, online courses, uh, where it can improve the staff uh, employment rate and also to have a lower employee training cost and also improve lifelong learning process. So uh, this combination of knowledge as a single platform for government agency, uh, the education institution, cooperation and also public will be combined together uh, whereby it can be a, a platform uh, for others. So uh, also within MARI, uh, we, we have lots of uh, training that we still continue. Uh, we have uh, more than 10 programs under the related to uh, upskilling, uh, the industry 4.0, lean production system. Now we are moving to the real implementation of e-learning platform. Most of the time previously we do this uh, between vendors and also uh, with the OEMs. Uh, but now we are shifting this uh, into the for public as well and also for us uh, to, to, to assist on the upskilling of the industry 4.0 uh, program. Okay, so the capability of uh, e-learning services uh, to have a single platform, uh, to have a learning services and also a digital content creation. Uh, you can see this at the major level or on the uh, scope of a company whereby they can use uh, this uh, for their own uh, talent development uh, and also for human capital development uh, that can be built by their own HR. Okay, so... Uh, strategic partnership, uh, we are seeing this as a collaboration with HR or related agencies in creation of uh, massive open uh, online courses uh, for cost saving to the participating companies uh, and also approach uh, companies to embark on first step uh, for the staff training uh, and also on the introduction of uh, compliance related certification, engineer, salesman or technician qualification and also others. So this is, will be a potential in collaboration with education industry and also for tie up with uh, any uh, agencies uh, for the industry 4.0 initiative. Okay, so uh, for my last uh, highlight, also last uh, slide on presentation, uh, benefit to stakeholders uh, for the companies, 
uh, dealer vendors, uh, public, and also for the nation. Uh, this is where I think uh, we cover up uh, from the uh, supply chain aspect of it and also uh, moving towards uh, the um, uh, technology and also that related to the uh, human capital development. So these three aspects is very important whereby the companies uh, can have the access uh, to qualify, qualified workforce. So maybe they have uh, more uh, um, a, a, a lower spending in HR and also uh, for uh, the supply chains uh, moving to a dealer, a vendor, uh, in the access to improvement of initiative and quality improvement uh, and moving towards uh, public uh, for easy access to the industry and also to have the employment opportunity in the industry. So as a whole uh, environment, uh, as the whole uh, benefit to stakeholders, uh, this is, like I mentioned, as combination of uh, the uh, supply chain, uh, the uh, human capital development and talent, and also moving towards the technology that we need. Uh, for that implementation. So I think uh, already covers on how uh, uh, the, the aspect of uh, new skills for a digital economy era. Uh, this is combining uh, the e-learning and also the businesses transformation in the age of experience uh, and also a bit of the recovery, recovery plan. Uh, but I only touch on the, uh, the uh, restarting supply chain and also rehiring and retraining. So uh, I think with that, uh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, in, uh, Inje Nismar, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we want to give the speakers uh, actually more <clears throat> opportunity to speak as well. So we'll go right directly into the next speaker uh, itself. And if you like um, Inje Nismar, so what, you can give him a thumbs up. Thank you very much for his wonderful uh, presentation just now. Stay online later because we were having okay. a, a Q&A we will have a, a Q&A session uh, later on because the interest of time. So we want to move on to the next speaker. So thank you. Give him a thumbs up as well, as you can see in the Facebook. Okay. okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is self. We have Dr. Sharul, the Director of Syrian Berhad Innovation of uh, Center of Innovation and Smart Manufacturing. Uh, let him please share on his insight as well. Do we have um, Dr. Sharul? Uh, Dr. Sharul? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, okay. All right, then. So I'm just going to take like five minutes, seven minutes to talk about the one. <coughs> I'm going to do, <coughs> I'm going to talk about hear. what is I 4.0, and then what do you need to know, and some uh, things on how, how the convergence will work and to help uh, all the people who are not working on, in Sounds the industry. Good. All right. Proceed. Okay. So imagine things before i mean i've been preaching all this uh, ever since two years ago i'm saying that okay look at it uh, this is what manufacturing is all about nowadays isn't it okay you see the consumers will be talking to the owner of the of the what do you call the manufacturers uh, and then the manufacturer will use all the manufacturing elements to produce the goods and to send it to consumers okay so i'm preaching for the last two years we said it has got to be done by the internet Okay, business owners can sit on the side and let this thing be controlled by the internet, by the IoT. Okay, so this is what I4.0 is all about. Now, with the COVID-19, you look at it now, you look at the manufacturing elements within the COVID-19, you see all the lorries and all these, uh, uh, the supply chains, you know it's not moving because it's not connected by the guy in the middle. So if it's, if it's possible for us to connect everything by the internet, with I4.0, we can solve all this problem. Are you still there, Anthony? Anthony, can you still hear me? I'm here. All right. Yes. So now look at it. This is the problem. Okay. Post COVID-19, this is what can happen. Okay. Okay. Even before COVID-19, you have 3 million foreign workers and you have 300,000 Malaysians who are employed. These are coming from universities. This is through source from Digital News Asia. Wow. So now, my question is, can you replace the 300,000 directly to the 3 million? Mm. You can't. Because the 300,000 kids wouldn't want to do the things that the 3 million people are doing now. Okay? So what you need to do now, what the industry needs to do now, is to increase the level of technology within the industry, okay, so you have all the automations and you have all the I4.0 being put in the industry 
and get the 300,000 to go in at a higher level. Okay, you are no longer talking about these kids coming in as, as upper operator pengeluaran. You are talking about these kids coming in as engineer that controls the I 4.0 element within the factory. Okay, all right. So what is I 4.0 is all about? It's a network of manufacturing resources. So you have machineries, robot conveyors, and whatnot. Okay, so mind me. I mean, this is the 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 key elements. But it has got to be autonomous, capable of controlling themselves in response to different situation. And it has got to be self-configuring. So it goes back to the uh, first and second slide that I showed you just now. Okay, it has got to be fully controlled by the machines, and that is what I 4.0 is looking at. So for now, as it is now, the uh, industry is not there yet. Okay, all right. Oh, sorry, that way. Okay. So next slide. Okay. Now, the fourth industrial revolutions can comprise. This is Klaus Schwab. If you talk about I4.0, you must know Klaus Schwab because he wants, he is one of the founder of I4.0. So you see, the fourth industrial revolution can compromise humanity, traditional sources of meaning, work, community, family, and identity. Okay? Look at the last word. They said the choice is ours. It has got to be based on shared destiny. Okay, this is the time. If you said you want to use I4.0, this is the time that you have shared destiny. What does it mean by that? Well, now with all the convergence of information, by now you know who's getting more, who's getting less. If you want to share, now is the time of sharing. So it has got to get equal, okay? Or fair in that sense. Might call me communist for that. But anyway, <laughs> so this is what first, second, third, fourth revolution is all about. I mean, people have seen this every day, I think. Okay, for the past two, three years. Now, in order for us to make ICE 4.0 a reality, you have got to have, to have four elements, okay? The merging of physical with cyber, okay? And the decision making with AI, the connectivity with the internet of things and the data storage within the cloud. Okay. Now, if you have four of these, then you can go into I 4.0. The question is, do we have this knowledge now? So now it goes back to what you are doing now, okay? So look at it. These are the technology, the pillars of technologies that are being agreed by the, by the country, by the government, with their policy. These are the 10 pillars, okay? I'm bringing it to the level that everybody can understand now, okay? So if you want to go and embark into I4.0 and understand that, these are the technology that you need to know. So if you are part of this technology now, then you are the people that, uh, what do you call, do you, uh, essential people, people that we need at the very moment. If you are not within this, then you have got to worry. Yeah. So now, we go back to the question. Okay? The question is, what can you do now? To those people that are not working now, what can you do? What you need to do now, now is the time for you to increase your competency. Okay, what competency do I need to increase? Look at this. These are the pillars of technology that, every, that will be important with IR 4.0. So this IR 4.0 will be very, very important post-COVID-19 and even during the time of COVID-19. Why? Okay, let me give you an example now. At the time of COVID-19, what is the biggest problem that we have now? We don't know who's sick, who's not, who's the who's being under PUI and who are supposed to be under quarantine and who's not. We don't know. The reason why we don't know because we are not converging in terms of the, the information. What I 4.0 wanted is for you to converge all the information that we know each and every one of you. Mm. Okay, if you if you are not able to do that, we are not I 4.0 yet. But let's say now, now is the time that we use I 4.0 to connect everybody together, to connect the GPS system of the phone that we have now and to know each and every one position and by, by then we were able to know who are the one infected and the one is not but that could another questions do are we ready to give away our, what we call, our um, privacy are we ready to give that away then some people say no we don't want to give it away but the fact is okay with i4.0 let's go back to what being said by cross swap the destiny is ours you have got to share. Okay, if you don't believe to want each other, so there's no point of having I 4.0. So my thing now is, 
what do you need to do now? Build up your capacity within that technology. Number two, get a professional certificate. Now is the time to go for your IR, to go for M-Bot. This is the time. Number three, if you want to do business that you wanted to do so much using the technology of i4.0, this is the time. And this for free. You can get all the information from either from centers like MIT, no or not. So I think this is the biggest opportunity of all time to learn new things. I'll stop here because I believe we're going to finish at 4.30, if I'm not wrong. So I'm going to leave you for questions, okay? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharo. It's a wonderful pleasure having you as well. Um, in the interest of time, we'll just run into the uh, next speaker. But if you can give us a thumbs up yourself for Dr. Dr. Sharo's presentation with his wonderful slides, as you can see, comprehensive, fast, and direct to the point. So let's move on to the final speaker of the day, and we'll get Q&A later. If you stay back for Q&A, we we'll get. And please ask on Slido and like on Slido which are the questions because we'll take the most popular questions out there, unfortunately, because of interest of time. Our final speaker today is Yang Bagia Dato Saha, the Chief Employment Insurance Office of Akeso. So Dato, hand over to you to share your current situation on the insights of how Akeso can help our Malaysian citizens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anthony. Um, distinguished uh, members of panel speakers. Is it all right? um, respected audience, um, <clears throat> My, my uh, topic presentation is PESO Employment Insurance Skills Strategy. Um, we have uh, about two, two segments. The first one is about our role during COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. As you see from the... Um, no, sorry, uh, we have to share this. Do you want to share yeah, Dr. Sharo, you can you unshare your slides? Dato Saha, would you be able to share? Sorry, all right, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. Just wait for a while. Yes. Or would you like me to share on your behalf? Yeah, already, I already put uh, on shares, uh, but um, it's a bit delay. Is it? Oh, can you put my, my slide on top of that? Yeah? Yes. This. We're doing it now. Okay. All right. You are able to, to see now my slides. Maybe you can, can proceed. Okay. Dato, up to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can we go to the next slide? All right. Um, can we go to the third slide? Yeah, that's what we're in the third slide now. I couldn't see. Okay, no man. Um, <clears throat> the third slide is with regard to statistics during COVID-19, you know, during the NCOs. If you see there, you know, um, the first... Um, chart there on the top left is uh, our retrenchment trend for the past 23 years. Uh, we have the highest incident of a retrenchment during 1997-98 uh, ASEAN financial crisis, which is around 83,200 uh, uh, workers being retrenched. And we have another round of a retrenchment during 2008-2009. And the latest one is uh, during COVID-19 um, um, uh, contagious uh, disease pandemic. Um, we expect the retrenchments can spike up to 225,000 this year. But uh, retrenchment is a delayed thing. So most likely spike with it uh, by end of this year, or most likely can go also to until next year, 2020, because of um, uh, we are an open trading countries. And if our trading partners like China, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Japan, and United States are not ready to open their markets, not mostly the, uh, recess the recession, the stagnation of the economy will be prolonged for, for Malaysia and the effect will be very high um, unemployment rate in Malaysia. On the, on the right side is our 
uh, monthly retrenchment for 20, if you compare for 2018, 2019, and 2020, you can see the spike, you know, um, for, the, the, for the past four months in 2020, the retrenchment is around 6,000 and below. Still very good, but we do not know um, how, well, how this will, will move when we go into second quarter and third quarter and fourth quarter. And, um, and also there we can say with you, um, our program uh, during this um, COVID-19 MCO, uh, government has allocated us about, um, um, I better share at the next, can you go to the next slide? We have uh, two programs. Uh, the first one is uh, employment insurance, which is a normal program under employment insurance, whereby uh, all the workers who lost employment will be assisted uh, through our fund um, for three to six months uh, based on their salary. 80 percent for the first month, uh, reducing to 50, 40, 40, and 30 percent. And uh, the second measure is. Um, Wage subsidy, which government has announced us uh, about 13.8 billion. Uh, so far, we have um, we have received an application from the employer uh, around 228,797 uh, application from employer, uh, which benefiting directly 1.5 million uh, workers. Instead of being retrenched, they are still uh, being employed. And the fund that already been paid out is around 1, 1.6 billion so far. And for employment retention program, this is for workers who are required to take unpaid leave. So far, we received about 24,552 employers um, applied for this program, which involve also about 208,900 uh, employees. So <clears throat> uh, just, just for knowledge sharing, um, since the, the, the allocation for ERP is about 120 million, uh, the, the fund that we have is already being used up. You know? So we have to stop this program. And for employer who has not um, uh, have the opportunity to apply for ERP, please uh, submit your application uh, under the wage subsidy program. Over there, for workers who, uh, for employer who has uh, 75 workers, Workers and below, they can claim up to um, 1,200 1, ringgit for, for employees who earn uh, below below 4,000 ringgit. And um, and the last one, uh, post-COVID measure, we also we also been given about um, 10 million. We have not utilized this uh, for this one for affected workers um, who lost employment and they couldn't get job after six months. Then we are thinking of um, extending the benefit uh, for another three months with uh, 600 ringgit per month, um, and also training fees um, up to 6,000 ringgit. The training fees is depend on the training that will be referred to our employment services officer, and with that also uh, the employees, um, the workers who undergo training will be given uh, training allowance 30 ringgit per day. Okay, next. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our employment insurance coverage uh, and employability issues. Um, on the on the left, um, uh, what do you call it, pie chart, you know, uh, we have total about 15 million uh, workforce in Malaysia. Uh, under Pekeso, under employment insurance coverage, we, we have about 7 million uh, in the working in the private, private sectors. And also, uh, in the future, we are thinking of uh, covering the self-employed in the informal sector about 2.8 2.8 million and also foreign workers you know we also need to cover them because uh, apparently uh, many uh, foreign workers also being abandoned by the employers um, because unable to pay their wages and on the next side uh, on the next uh, next um, pie chart is the the graduate um, output every year we have around 3000 341,000 graduate will be graduating every year, uh, joining the labor market. Our, our concern here is, say, the retrenchment figures um, spike more than um, 200,000, 300,000, uh, plus the 525,000 unemployed um, job seekers, 
we will have around 600 to 900,000 uh, unemployment number in the country, which is very big. And the problem with the um, with the graduate to compete for job is very difficult because uh, currently uh, during the COVID-19, the uh, the job opening for graduate, you know, uh, in the category of managerial, uh, professional, executive, and um, associate professors are limited. So we have um, a case here. We just fall under responsibility of um, case so EIS because we already being um, being um, mandated by the government to be public employment services for Malaysia. So. All the unemployed person, the unemployed graduate, will be our responsibility to look for a uh, job for them and also to reskill them. Okay, next. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Uh, this is a survey done by OECD um, when they came to Malaysia last uh, last year. If we compare uh, Malaysian position with other ASEAN countries. We could see the incident of uh, training in Malaysia is the lowest in ASEAN. This is really worrying me because um, as you compare to Thailand and Philippines and Vietnam, they are very strong when it comes to skill upgrading, reskilling of our workforce. Uh, bear in mind that um, <clears throat> the, the main agency for training in Malaysia currently is a Human Resource Development Fund, HRDF, but they only cover about 27,000 um, employers as compared to what we, ha what we have in our data, 450,000 employers. So meaning not many employers are um, uh, firm offering training for their employees and very small, smaller number of workers being offered training by, by the employer. So we would like under employment insurance system to cover them all uh, by using our fund. Okay, next. Workforce development challenges in Malaysia. There, there are a few, there are a few uh, challenges that we'd like to share with you. Um, the first one is the absence of one-stop information center, re repository of all available training program and training providers uh, in the country, and also the assistant. And also, uh, our recommendations is to would like to have uh, EIS to take the lead in managing workforce development and the management management system. And second one, industry like rely too much on uh, low skill foreign workers and which is also labor intensive. After post COVID, we are going to look again the uh, employment policy in Asia. We would like to reduce the dependency on the foreign unskilled foreign workers. And also uh, to to move forward, we have uh, the, the employer need to the industry need to embrace uh, industrial revolution 4.0 and to use uh, digital uh, technology to, to move forward. And the third one, there's no direction, no clear direction on national skill strategy because too many players, too, too many ministries. Um, and also we have to strengthen the um, public employment services through uh, EIS. Uh, currently we are developing Malaysian standard, Malaysian uh, skill occupation and competencies based on ESCO in Europe to really uh, go by a, a single digit occupation um, to identify skills and competencies requir requirement for, for all occupation. And from there, then we can analyze uh, which occupation are really um, uh, really needing to be upgrade their competencies and skills. And the first one, too, many sub, too, many, too much supply on the academic graduates, where, whereby, whereas uh, job creation require, requires more TWED graduate based on skills and power. I believe in Malaysia, almost 70% of uh, our school leavers uh, enroll into academic university as compared to about 11% uh, uh, in Netherlands mm -hmm. and most of around 30% in Germany. So in Europe, in Western Europe, most uh, graduate will enter university, but they are entering into Tibet um, kind of um, tertiary education, not so much academic. So. <clears throat> In, in this context, uh, we need to, to bridge um, between labor market and education and training system. Uh, to do this, we need to have a very good um, labor, market, uh, labor market information uh, system, which uh, we are still developing now. And currently also we have uh, defragmented uh, approach to training, too many players, as mentioned just now. 
that we need to do the mapping all the security system, aligning policies, identifying policy priorities, and making policy recommendations. Uh, bear in mind, uh, EIS, we, we, are, we don't intend to, to be a, a training provider, but we try to make the um, uh, data and information with regard to skills gap and uh, the requirement of uh, industry and occupation to be transparent and for everybody to have a look. And for, for say, Minister, Ministry of Education and universities to properly plan their, their um, uh, education and output based on the real demand. Uh, next is the slide on understanding occupation and labor market. As I mentioned just now, um, we just developed Malaysian uh, skills, competencies, uh, qualification and occupation based on ESCO, which is European Skills and Competencies. Uh, currently, we are using MASCO. MASCO do not describe uh, skills, do not uh, describe competences, qualification, tools, and technology to be used. But uh, by using ESCO and SOC in Malaysia, we are trying to fill all the gaps and everybody will hopefully will benefit from what we are uh, intend to do. Um, okay, can, can, can we go to that, the next slide? No? Um, <clears throat> based on on uh, on ESCO, we have around uh, almost 3,000 uh, occupation at the five-digit level. Uh, uh, for example, if we go to uh, code 3321, which is uh, insurance brokers, next. Uh, in our in our MSOC, we try to describe every each in the, uh, occupation, uh, the um, what do you call it, the qualification uh, requirement, the field of studies, the job description, and the most important, the column, the last column, skills and competences competences that this job should have. So from there, we there are a lot of uh, other columns, you know, like uh, knowledge, uh, technology to be used. Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, mm -hmm. Other skills that need to be learned from, and and from there we 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 are able to analyze uh, deeply uh, every occupation needs when it comes to competences and uh, knowledge, because uh, skill, competences, and knowledge after uh, after graduate uh, after graduate for say after five five ten years, the first uh, degree of the unit is uh, no long, no longer relevant. No, the the experience and the skill that um, Workers have is the most important for matching in the in the world of work. Um, okay, next. Um, and for training uh, during this COVID, we put on hold our training because um, <clears throat> because of the pandemic, you know. So we are looking at online courses. Um, we try to use whatever courses that we uh, we have in the country also overseas. Uh, for example, like this Coursera courses offered by Coursera in the US, you know. I think the 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 topic of courses that provided by them is very much relevant to Malaysia, especially in the Dato. Dato, we couldn't hear you. Dato. Hello. Dato, we can't hear you. Hello. Okay, Dato, yes. Okay, Dato, yes. We can oh, hear now. We can hear now. Okay, okay. Um, so we, we find uh, online courses are very, very uh, affordable, you know, very competitive, and cover a wide range of uh, courses. This is uh, Coursera courses um, from overseas. I, I do not know how many. Um, local uh, training providers uh, could offer this kind of courses that you are willing to you know to subscribe to this because um, for our uh, retrench workers uh, they are entitled to go to be referred to to attend any courses that are relevant to their needs and also uh, relevant to the need of the industries all the courses will be borne by EIS and also during uh, during uh, training uh, they also can can be given a training allowance about 30 ringgit per day so I think that's all my 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 presentation today. If there is any question, we are willing to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Dato. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Yes. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of out there. there.
And um, I think we take a uh, whole line of questions as well. Um, can you guys hear me clearly? Or are you hearing any feedback? Um, yeah. There's feedback, there's feedback, I think. Hello? Hear me now? Clearly better? Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, Dato Saha, there is some questions itself uh, regarding Pekeso as well. So I'll be turning on to Slido. If you have any other questions on Slido as well, you can actually uh, go on to Slido and see. What is that? Okay. Yeah. Um, the question here. Uh, early on, you answered that question says 66 likes. So a lot of people has actually taken a look on that. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would you answer this area as well. But there's uh, questions like, what about non-performing employees? Can they be retrenched? These are popular questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for non-performing uh, employees, uh, uh, before they retrench the workers, they have to follow the guideline from the industrial relation, um, uh, industrial relation, um, what do you call it, uh, regulation, and also, also the Employment Act 1955. Okay, yes, Dato. All right, there's other questions itself, um, like when will SOXO issue lists of clinics for COVID-19 tests? Dato, would you be able to hear me? Okay, can I move on itself to the next question itself? Uh, upskilling and reskilling program during MCO has not been published greatly. Hesha usually gets gets uh, via personal WhatsApp group. Uh, is it good that it, be, it can be coordinated through HRDF? So there's two board members out here, which we have uh, Dato Palani and also uh, Mr. Rahim. Would you all be able to answer this question? Yeah, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> we are, we are, in fact, we are working closely with HRDF, but um, HRDF, um, I would say their, their, their coverage are too, too small, about 20, 27 uh, employers, whereas uh, we open to everybody, and also most likely we have to open to also unemployed graduate in the future. So, um, I don't think any any problem because uh, whoever training providers are registered under HRF, we, we have to also work closely with them. No problem. Okay, there's another question to Dato Saha. Can employees be asked to take paid annual leave and unpaid annual leave during MCO period? I would say no. This one have to be referred to uh, labor department, sorry. Okay, so the answer is there, up to labor department. So I think this is another similar. I'm trying to collate the questions together so that uh, we will not have uh, repetitive questions on this. And forgive me if we could not answer every single uh, question that is out there. Say for EIS claim, can it be a fixed term contract apply as well as their contract would not be renewed due to COVID-19 and the company has to cease the operation? Um, no. I, um if the worker being retrenched, not not to say retrenched, sorry. If the if the expiry expiry of contract, um, the employees um, are not entitled to to claim for employment insurance unless uh, they are being retrenched uh, before the contract finish. Is it clear? Yes, yes, it's clear. <clears throat> okay, so maybe one or two more questions that I can see here. Uh, I'm just refreshing. Uh, my Slido, just to take a look. Is there any other new questions? Yes. Okay. So, um, there's another question I saw itself. Um, I'm not sure how it works. If the nature of the work can allow a staff to work from home, would be able to start with A, Clearing of annual leave, B, unpaid leave, or C, pay cut? 
this is just an advice only. Nato? Nato Saha? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. That's still thinking. Um, okay, sorry. It's a nature of work. Can Carmela go home with a cleaning? We can't appreciate. I, I leave it to the employer, but please uh, seek the advice from, from the labor department and also discuss with the employees. Right? Yes. So as you guys can see yourself, remember, um, SOXO is not the labor department. Labor department is still needs to be referred to and always have a negotiation with the employees. Uh, I think this question, if company has signed up and received first month wage subsidy, can employees be retrenched in the subsequent months due to still no income revenue? If the employee's name is under the 200 list, no, um, then employer should not uh, retrench them. In fact, the, 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 the subsidy that we pay to the employer must be paid to the, to the workers. All right. So it's clear that I think every single, uh, they need to be paid. Okay. So I think there's a repetitive question here. Okay. All right, other questions like for this, for those who earn more than two and 2005, holding managerial position, if we choose to retrench, should we pay the termination benefit? This is also under the Labor Department uh, purview. The, the 2005, I'm not sure. All right, so this uh, this is, is under a uh, different department um, area as well. Okay, so I would like to actually highlight as well, that this is, the car, this is another person here. If the company has received the first month wage subsidy, subsequently the month, well, I think this is a repetitive question that we've answered earlier on. Okay. So I think that's all for Dato Saha's question at this uh, moment. But we have other questions as well of uh, importance as well that we find that how can this message importantly to be passed out to retrench to unemployed or even to the public as well how can these questions be 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 passed out to them Dato Saha oh uh, please please uh, send email to us uh, perkeso at perkeso.gov.my Okay, so Pekeso at pekeso.gov.my. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, we have some questions that I'm trying to retrieve, but I couldn't, but I received these questions from the Facebook. I know some of them did not uh, go directly to Slido, but some of them are in the Facebook. So let me try to retrieve from some of these questions as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, COVID-19 is a vicious and so impact to business. SMEs are looking at IR 4.0 and IT to reinvent their business. And how fast can we have that? We cannot simply change our business direction instantly. We lose job with nothing to recover immediately. How do you all propose to get the balls rolling? Because going to take process application, time take, for, but we have mouths to feed. Would any of the panelists would like to answer that? Dato Palani is awfully quiet. Maybe he can actually answer that. Uh, okay, uh, probably, I mean, again, uh, the, the, the concern is what? On the compliance or sustainability? I, I couldn't catch the question. Yeah, they are looking uh, to reinvent their business. How fast can they do that? Because currently right now, they cannot simply change their business direction because they are losing jobs and they cannot recover. How are they going to move towards this? This area, I, I think uh, no, no. I just just a thought. I think probably what is important now. I think which each and every business entity is looking at is that we got to look into a short term strategy, where how to uh, you ensure uh, survival, sustainability in the short run, right? As as we talk about engaging into technology innovation, uh, smart manufacturing or, or IT based or IoT based uh, applications. But I think business need to survive, need to sustain. After you cross the sustainable period, then only you'll be able to look into the next step. So I think uh, it's very, very pertinent for, 
for I think uh, each each business uh, entity to go back to the drawing board and then start to look at what are your real uh, strength and why and the areas that actually that you need to explore and then and, and the creation how do you convert uh, re 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 innovate the structure of your business because a lot of I think when as the crisis goes in you could see that a lot of manufacturers change their a lot of business change their form of the business some that has been actually operating to manufacture textile has actually moved into manufacture uh, other garments that is required for the industry you know so simultaneously you can see that some industries which are generally involved in chemical started to manufacture sanitizers because the nature of the business the production may allow you to le leverage to explore such a situation and and i, I believe many entities which actually even in in uh, in i think uh, for example uh, those even that is in in uh, education started to invest in some kind of technology platform and started to con conduct classes uh, where literally in some uh, business entity they, they they are been going on as as per normal the students attending they are having a break time they are having lunch break and things go so so i think it is it is not about uh, uh, saying if you wanted to do the same thing over and over like what Einstein said and you expect a different result that's insanity what we need to do is that how that we can leverage from these challenges and reinvent the business and i think that's a that's a that's the challenge for everybody who's running in a business to look to go back to the drawing board because what was right two months ago may not be relevant now so okay. i have a question to adato palani as well and also to the uh, as if you said a good effort to your survey, what is the next step for FMM? Will FMM conduct a joint effort with METI and its agencies such as CIRIM, MPC, MARI and so on to promote available grants and assistance to industries? Right, okay. I think uh, FMM has and also... We can open these questions to the rest of the other uh, METI members as well. I will, okay, I'll start yeah. it off first. I think uh, uh, from the FMM side, I think FMM has always been uh, an engaging organization. And I think even during uh, this uh, crisis period, some of our services is still actually going on as per normal. And then I think uh, we have been, uh, the, we have got back uh, staffs who are working actually and uh, providing the support service to the manufacturers, be it the basic questions uh, they, they need to know, or even the extended one even to lie on with the authorities. So that is one part in terms of the services to the member. But I think even prior to COVID itself, uh, FMM has got a working relationship with uh, MITI and MIDA. We are part of very integral part of the IR 4.0 team at MITI. In fact, we were one of the strategic partners of the MITI to on the launching of the IR 4.0 agenda. And I think with CIRIM also, we have, we have I think, through the uh, various engagement session, we have explored various uh, opportunities to work together and uh, I think uh, we uh, what is at the end of the day uh, we should be able to bring all these opportunities platform to the benefit of the members and I think uh, I'll take this opportunity my president country saw is very proactive and, and very supportive of agenda of collaborating and networking together with the the government agencies to deliver what that is to be given to SME because about 80% of our members are also more than 80% are SME. And actually they are the, the, the engine of the growth as well as the group that is very uh, badly affected. So we look forward to, to, to explore and deliver the best uh, way with the various stakeholders. Yes, what about other panelists? Anthony. Yes, Dr. Shah. And Jermaine on this one, okay, there's two questions. The first question is regard to what can they do immediately, okay? Yes, correct. So, <clears throat> to answer this, can they do me, can, can anyone do me a favor? I mean, if you are in the, in the industry where you are, first put up, where, where are you in the value chains? Are you the managers? Are you the staff? Um, are you the well, gen workers? Or whatever, okay. Then only you can do some planning, okay? If you are the managers, if you are the owner of the company, so the strategy is different. If you are, a, a general worker, so you're one of the staff. Now is the time for you to do capacity building. If you're talking about you are the owners, the owners should not be lying. I mean, the owners should understand there are potential winners and there are potential losers. Okay, so people who, who, who are going to be in it, okay, 
who are going to be in, in, in airline business, in automation, these are going to be the losers, but there are people who are going to be winners. Okay, so those who are going to be winners, so you have to have your plan, your midterm plan, it must be that. Okay, the second question, all the grants, all the initiative are continuously being done throughout the COVID-19. Even in CIRIM now, we have all the development um, grants for the industry to develop, to do the development, to increase your productivity. So this is the time. If you are in the, in the winning sectors, now is the time for you to increase your productivity. And where do you get money to, do the, to increase your productivity? Start talking to us. We will help you in installing the technology that increase your productivity. So you can produce more things at a cheaper price during the post-COVID-19 period. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have Inche Rahim who, 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 who has given his view as well. Thank, thank you, Anthony. I concur with uh, my panelist colleagues. Uh, and if I may share, like uh, one of the best practices that we encounter during this uh, COVID-19 was uh, this company known as Farm Fresh, supplying fresh milk. And during the first week of MCO, they, they discover that they, they realized that their sales have tremendously dropped. So what they did was, uh, like mentioned just now, going back to the drawing board, uh, they analyzed and they discovered that like uh, the, the group they call uh, Horika, hotel, restaurant, cafe, which contributed to 20% of the sales are all gone. So what they did was uh, they focused on uh, online sales. And uh, the second week uh, of uh, MCO, um, um, their, their online sales from uh, 300, 300 bottles jumped to 10,000 bottles. So because uh, they, they analyzed that everybody is sitting, sitting home at home, so um, people just uh, buy online. So this is one of the uh, what we call best practices that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the, the, the industry can, can look upon, especially the small and medium enterprises. And to assist them also, what MPC have done was we organized what we call the virtual um, advisory clinic. Okay, This clinic is not to test for COVID-19, okay? but this clinic is to provide uh, guidance, assistance uh, to uh, companies that are having difficulty in, um, in, in managing their business. So feel free to come to uh, MPC's Facebook and um, uh, find the what you call uh, the opportunity to join our virtual advisory clinic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any word from Mr. Nismar? All right. Okay. Let's move on. I think we have one last question because uh, the time is already over. So to Dato Sahar as well. Um, WS doesn't allow pay cut. WS um, wage subsidy does not allow pay cut. Trench yeah. or NPL? NPL is a um, non-performing loan. Is it? No pay leave. No pay leave. Sorry. Okay, but it's silent on deduction of annual leave. Soxo advises to refer to JTK and JTK's advice to get mm -hmm. employees consent, but not all the employees give their consent. Since there's no one, since there is. One of company's survival mode, we hope MOHR can fully support costs to waive getting consent from employees. It was a long question. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to answer this. I think um, <laughs> we, we, can, we can convey the message to our colleague in labor department you know, for them to have a review on this. All right. So at least uh, in the ministry, they're trying to actually see how we can collate. So as you guys see, there's quite a number of questions out there. We are unable because we already uh, um, overshot our time already and we are unable to answer all these questions, but we'll try to actually answer one of it. If you, you still look back and Slido within the next one or two days, we'll try to answer. And maybe if some of it we can't answer, we could actually ask the panelists as well to answer some of it. And we'll try to get back to you either on the Facebook, that answer, or either on Slido. In the next one or two days, if you're able to. Uh, don't blame us if you're not able to answer all of it, but we'll try our very best. So, last but not least, I'd just like to leave you with a final word itself and what we are trying to achieve here as well. 
let me just share with you. Uh, besides this, we are able to see the slides. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Would you all be able to see my slides? Yes. All right. So MIT, we're actually offering now 300 free upskilling and reskilling IR 4.0 training spaces online. You could actually get to. Uh, would you all be able to see the slides? No, I'm trying to share it again. My apologies. Sometimes technology can. Yeah, so this is the program that we're doing. Um, MIT professional training, we're offering 300 free upskilling and reskilling IR 4.0 training. The prerequisite is a diploma in engineering or technical or minimum one year experience in field of engineering and technical field possesses or possesses a technical certification. This will be through our MIT learning management system with live learning as well. You can log on to see what are the courses available and register at bit.ly MOT, uh, MIT COVID-19. The deadline for registration is on 11th May. So the other courses that we are trying to put in as well on big data, digital marketing, and other training courses will be coming soon. As you can see, you can register at bit.ly MIT COVID-19. For more information, you could actually contact or WhatsApp us. So there's also questions as well that you would like the slides from all the speakers. Yes. Please share us your feedback on this webinar and what are the topics that we would like to hear during post-COVID-19 uh, and post-COVID-19 as we're going to do other series with other government agencies which we could not be able to cover on also on post-COVID. The feedback form below is bit.ly MIT feedback. The speaker slides will be provided upon filling up the forms. So we're able to do, uh, to actually send you this information. And if you'd like to contact me and so on and contact us, this is my contact details. You could actually screenshot or you can actually view and you could actually call or WhatsApp the number below. So before we end as well, I would like to thank all the speakers once again and everyone here as well to give a, to give a thumbs up to all the speakers. So can we have a thumbs up in our Facebook to give them a thumbs up for all their wonderful sharing all their wonderful effort and time that they've given. And of course, I'm, we apologize, we can't cover everything, but I think we've actually done a great job as well. And thank you very much, the speakers. I'll give you a round of applause. And also give us a thumbs up and do follow us on social media and Facebook and so on. And we'll be able to continue having more of these sessions, especially the MCO is up to 12 of May or maybe even longer. We're not sure, but definitely, We'll be keeping in touch, we'll be engaging with the industry and we'll be helping all the time. That is our, our time here with you and appreciate for everyone's time and thank you very much, speakers. So thank you, speakers, once again and thank the you. audience. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Have you a guys. wonderful day and from me, I'm signing out here, um, Anthony from MIT. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.